Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Chuck Smythe, and I'm the director of the Culture and History Department here at Sea Alaska Heritage Institute. And I'd like to welcome you to the final lecture we had this month. It's been quite a series, wonderful series, and we have an outstanding lecture here today. So please, um, I'd like to remind everyone, please, to turn off your cell phones if you haven't already. Just double check. It's always good to, to do that. Um, and I'd like to introduce our speakers today. Um, Doc Hutsu, Judy Ramos, is from the Kwashki Kwan Ginnik Kwan clan in Yakutat. She is assistant professor of Alaska Native Studies at University of Alaska Fairbanks. And we're going to hear about her PhD project today, which is part of an Arctic Studies Center, Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History Research Project documenting the 900-year-old history of Alaska Natives' relationship to the Hubbard Glacier and seal hunting in Yakutat Bay. Um, and Dr. Aaron Kroll is it, the Alaska Director of the Smithsonian Institution's Arctic Studies Center in Anchorage and curator of the center's collaborative exhibit, Living Our Cultures, Sharing Our Heritage, The First Peoples of Alaska. Which, is that winding down now, or is that? A few more years to go. Oh, good, good. It's a fabulous exhibit, encyclopedic. If you haven't seen it, I encourage you to go. Um, he is an Arctic, subarctic archaeologist and anthropologist whose research and publications have focused primarily on the peoples of the Gulf of Alaska region, where he is currently leading this NSF-funded study of the human and environmental history of Yakutat Bay in partnership with the Yakutat Tlingit tribe. Um, he will be speaking, they will both be speaking on the indigenous knowledge of Yakutat people and will discuss the Yakutat Sealing Project, uh, which ran from 2011 to 2014 and combined oral history and archaeology to explore a thousand years of community history in Yakutat Bay. And so I'm very pleased to have them here. We've had them here before already, so it's great to have them back, and uh, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Welcome, everyone, and uh, I'll just, uh, I'll be starting off, but then uh, Judy will take over the, the second half here, and I, I appreciate the, uh, the nice introduction and overview uh, to the project, uh, Chuck. And this is a uh, community-based uh, collaborative project on community history, knowledge, and culture. And uh, I'm the principal investigator. Uh, Judy is the, um, one of the senior researchers, as was uh, her mom, Elaine Abraham. And uh, her father, uh, George Ramos, was the person who invited the project uh, to happen in the community and shared uh, traditional key knowledge You'll be hearing from both of them in the videos that we're going to show today. And there were many other elders and community members who, of all ages, who contributed uh, to the work, to the research, and generously shared their knowledge. And we thank, we thank all of them. And the project was about combining oral tradition, uh, traditional ecological knowledge, and archaeology. And I think, in the broadest sense, it was about the intersection of indigenous knowledge and uh, Western science and how those ways of uh, knowing and looking at the world can come together, can inform and uh, complement each other. And as Chuck mentioned, uh, we're looking at the uh, 900,000 year community history that includes the migrations of Eak, Atna, and Tlingit peoples to Yakutat Bay, uh, the retreat of the glaciers, and I'll be talking about that in a minute, the opening up of the bay, uh, the uh, thousands of harbor seals that uh, gather at the ice edge, the glacier's edge, each spring to give birth to pups, uh, and the importance of the harbor seals uh, to sustaining the community, uh, the indigenous knowledge about hunting them, which is quite detailed. Uh, and that was in the early days from wooden uh, canoes uh, and harpoons, then in historic times with uh, rifles, 
And today, uh, s harbor seals are a very, very important part of the diet of the people in Yakutat, so that the tradition continues. Um, and as, uh, as George uh, Ramos had told us, as the glacier retreated over time, the hunt, seal hunting camps always kept close to the glacier where people would go every spring. And so the older sites are out near uh, the mouth of the bay. You know, uh, explain that in a second. So we did complete the archaeology and all of the community interviews, some 70 interviews with people in the community. Uh, and we're working now on a, a final report and creation of a video archive. And that is also funded by National Science Foundation. And that will be uh, uh, given here to Sea Alaska Heritage Institute and to Yakutat Tlingit Tribe in Yakutat as a resource for community history. And we're, we're here today to share some interesting samples from that extensive archive and give you a sense of uh, some of the really interesting things we learned and uh, recorded while we were there. So I will introduce the first video, um, which focuses on one of the very well-remembered sealing camps in Disenchantment Bay at the head of Yakutat Fjord, um, and it, which people used for almost a century, from the mid-1800s up until approximately the 1930s. So uh, I've mentioned the retreat of the glaciers. If Here's Yakutat Bay, and this was the approximate location of the ice around uh, 1400 AD. And those are just some of the older archaeological sites, older village sites that were uh, around the bay at that time. And then when the ice pulled back, uh, it opened up that there's Disenchantment Bay at the head. And we're going to be talking about those sites where it says 1890s. Those are all relatively recent seal camps. And particularly about one that's the EAC name for it is Kek Otlia. It's also known as Disenchantment Bay Sealing Camp and uh, Shanak Plain. Now, uh, there's actually uh, several locations along. Here's Disenchantment Bay. And uh, in uh, 2011 and 2013, the archaeological part of this project uh, explored around here and found, relocated all these sites. People, of course, remembered them very well. But finding them as archaeological sites uh, was, a new, was a new adventure. And it was very exciting to discover uh, these um, remains of these uh, camps where people had lived and hunted seals. And particularly, we're going to talk about this one down at Indian Camp Creek. Now, when in 1899, the Harriman Alaska Expedition arrived in Yakutat Bay, and they were told that everyone in the village was up at the head of the bay, in Disenchantment Bay here, at their sealing camp. And Edward Curtis was the photographer along on the expedition. And he took these photographs. And you can see the camp. Um, and th people were living in canvas wall tents, but they were also making the traditional bark-covered structures, which were being used as uh, smokehouses for smoking the seal uh, meat. And uh, so there's the, the way it looked in 1899. And then this is a photograph of the shoreline today. What happened just a few months after those photographs were taken was a very, very large earthquake in Yakutat Bay, which uplifted the shoreline. So these um, structures, which were down along the beach in June of 1899, were uplifted back away from the shoreline in September of 1899. And thereafter, they were overgrown, and everyone lost track. The people who used the site later were, whoops, were camping down along here on the, on the modern beach. But the old settlement is back there. And uh, it was very interesting when we went out there and found this place. So here's one of the photographs. And you see the ridge line. And you can line that up with the modern place. And so we were standing right in this old location, back from the shoreline, where those uh, bark structures were. And then this is what it looks like on the ground. There was part that was uplifted. And the remains of that camp are up on this terrace. Um, And then I'll just, there's the beach, the beach berm, a stream channel. There's been a lot of erosion in that area. And then there's the uplifted terrace. And then these are 
rock circles that were around the tents and the bark uh, structures. So essentially, part of the site survived on that terrace. Some of it has been washed away, but part of it has survived exactly as the way people walked away from it in the summer of 1899. Here are rocks that outline one of the tents. And we think that the inner line of rocks was to hold down the canvas. The outer larger rocks were for lines, you know, guy lines for the tents. And then if you look at, there were lots of artifacts in the tents, especially uh, lots of uh, beads. Turned out people uh, were doing lots of bead work in the interim when they weren't working on uh, processing seals. Hundreds and hundreds of those beads. And then these are, there were a lot of uh, implements that were left from the weapons that were being used to hunt seals. So this is a 44 center file rifle cartridge from the 1870s that was inside one of the houses. And this, as I mentioned, the seal hunting tradition uh, comes right up uh, to the present. This is Jeremiah James and a seal that he shot on a hunt that we filmed in 2014. And the thing that I want to talk about, and what now you're going to see the video, um, George Ramos introduces uh, this location, this place, uh, and then uh, Elaine Abraham talks about this community visit. After we had finished our excavations in 2013 and invited the whole community to come up, um, this was a very important event. It was a reconnecting with the ancestors who had lived in that place. And uh, Chusha will explain uh, what the rituals that they did, why they were necessary, and what, what they did at the site. And so let's, Heather, if we could run the first one now. This place I was standing on is called Kanak Kuwuk. That means the big valley. The bay is located here and the glacier is around the corner, which is a take. That means you come around uh, <clears throat> the point over here and go behind it. And so they call it a take, that which is behind. One thing about the Clinket culture is land ownership is one of the first laws. Nobody comes into your land until you give them permission, such as uh, a trade-off. We had seal here by the hundreds in this way, and people down below had herring eggs and we, and we could trade off, make an agreement to hunt in there. Mm -hmm at the season, and they can come and hunt in ours. But I understand that most of the people, like from Sitka, from uh, <clears throat> Juneau, when they come up to hunt here, they camped on the other side that you can see way across there. And they had the location that they mm -hmm. lived in. Mm -hmm. And all the Yaktat people was to uh, pick this area. And one of the clan leaders that controlled this place, his clan moved, uh, owned it. And he used to say that no one is going to go up there until the little pups are strong enough to fend for themselves. When the little pup gets strong enough, they can swim for. Then he says, OK. And all night long, people used to get their gear and start rowing up here. When we got off the boat, the traditional way is you appease the ocean and the land, the spirit of the land. So we had to do that and do the uh, Hubbard Glacier with his wives and all his children. His old wife, first wife is Turner, his young wife is Valerie. 
And then they have all these mountains that are their children all the way to Mount Fairweather. And Mount Fairweather used to be Mount St. Elias' um, other half, Spice. But they quarreled all the time. So they decided we are going to move the wife, Mount Fairweather, but we'll always see each other with all our children under between us. So that's Mount St. Elias. So by coming ashore to that land, you have to appease all the land and you have to mention them. And that's what we were doing. So when my father used to take us up, he timed it so that we reached that shore we were at, Shanachtain. Right, Kai? Mm -hmm. Shanachtain. And so that we reached that place at uh, sunup. So he would, he would anchor our canoes and first of all, he would appease, he would go through all that um, naming of all the areas and that, that we are honoring them and that we are there because we need food and they provide all the resources to them. But that place belongs to Kanev Khan. So you're actually talking to your own clans people by talking to Hubbard Glacier and all of the area that Hubbard claims. And what I did was I named as many of the of the our people that drowned and we gave them tobacco. But going back to to the fire we were calling all of these uh, names and and uh, honoring them with tobacco. Each one of us honored them with tobacco. The fire takes it to the spirit world. The teeth who are ach hashakun are trained in his cheese stugachat the teeth. It's really our uh, honor and our privilege to be here and not only to learn about the ancestral Tlingit people who lived here over 100 years ago in the 1870s and 1880s, but uh, to learn from them uh, through the archaeology and the oral tradition. And there are the remains of, we think, seven or eight of the houses are here. The first part of our potlatch, we have the morning uh, ceremony where we sing our morning songs. And our morning is um, the yake of the owl. That's what we drum at our morning. And then we start the calling of the names Kusas Kaiti. Kusas Kaiti. Yvonne Henry Kaiti. Then Henry Kaiti. A heat. Chikunal Kaiti. Chikunal Kaiti. James Kushkan Jr. Kaiti. James Kushkan Jr. Kaiti. So, because we were looking at a site where we don't know who, what people were there, but they have left an essence of their spirit in that excavation there. It'll always be there. That's who we were talking to. 
to celebrate life as we are today, to the humans that are today. And that was the happy time. And that was when um, Janice wanted to do two songs to talk about the happy time. And at a morning ceremonies, we finish that, and then we go to closing the door to the spirits, which I was doing by the drums. The drums said, you have to leave us and not cling to us. The spirits, you have to go back to the spirit world. All the spirits that are here are awake and with us. We can't let them follow us. So we have to let them know we're closing that door between death and the living. So my grandson closes it and the drums puts them back to sleep. Yeah, well, thank you, Erin. Goodness, sheesh, goodness, sheesh. So it's uh, so enlightening for me to see those videos again of my mother talking and my father because um, so many of our elders since we started have passed away. So I'm honoring uh, those elders who were part of the project um, because my, um, my mom has passed, Lena has passed, Janice has passed. They're both uh, all from Koshka Kwan from my clan. So thank you, my Koshka Kwan brother, for being here and giving me support. It's just, uh, sorry, it's so emotional. We're gonna have my mom's kui maybe uh, this August. Um, but I've been, really been honored to be part of this project. Yeah, I'm not, not ready to start it yet. So, so I just wanted to introduce myself and sing it. So. My name is Dachutsu. Um, that goes back to original to our Atna people. That's originally an Atna name. Kashka Kwan Ayakat, that little creek uh, is a Kwash uh, Creek, which is Iak. Uh, Kwan is Klinket. So we have a mixture of uh, Iak Klinket and uh, um, uh, Atna in our people's language and history. Our style of dress and everything is Atna. Many of the place names are Iak. Um, a lot of our oral history goes back to our Atna origins. So um, I'm from the uh, daughter of uh, George Ramos, who's Coho, and I know there's some Coho swimming around here. <laughs> I spy some. <laughs> Thank you, Coho, my, my, grand, my, my father's people. I'm daughter of the brown bear people who are originally the Tlingit people from, um, from Ketchikan, Ketchikan that migrated up the coast. And I was telling Aaron the story of my grandfather's migration story when mom, um, when um, the volcanoes are still um, erupting is when our people came up. They also settled in Nangoon and settled in Dry Bay and settled in Yakutat. That's the big uh, house screen. It's now in the uh, state uh, museum, um, the Golden Eagle house screen. That was my grandfather's people. Most of his uh, atu is still in the Sheldon Jackson Museum. I love the story about the mountains because um, I was, um, telling the story to my um, my new son-in-law, he's Maori, and he says, we have walking mountains too. And I said, what, you have walking mountains too? And I, it occurred to me, the Makan Mountain is regarding geological change with the great uplift. Um, the mountains used to be closer together and with the geological earthquakes, the mountains separated. So I was like, oh wow, it's totally looking at oral history from a different perspective. The mountains, Mount St. Elias, Mount Feather used to be close together with geological uplift, they separated. So it's just looking at oral history from a different viewpoint. A different point is because this ancient knowledge goes back thousands and thousands of years. So we take this, um, um, this 
oral history and bring it into the present, but we still have to take it apart, analyze it, interpret it. So this is really fascinating for me to take a look at our oral history and um, looking at this. So, um, so this, uh, as he mentioned, came out of uh, a story my father was telling to Dr. Langdon about the, um, the, uh, the nine uh, seal camps. And um, this, uh, it's, I'm really happy that we were able to take this and combine it with uh, uh, Dr. Kroll, who has um, the expertise and knowledge of how to, um, uh, to take uh, the archeology span information you can look at the landscape and see features in the landscape, which, which I would not be able to see. Well, you could tell there's these old sites. Well, how do you tell these old sites with the, you know, looking at that and uh, showing how our migration and settlement is uh, based on um, uh, the information he, go, he recovers through uh, archeology span and bring in the oral history and bring in the geology, which shows the, the um, the, the movement of the glaciers. So taking um, this and looking at it, uh, and it does bring us up to date with climate change. And so that was part of that, but also um, looking at the language, the place names, and all the terminology that my father explains in this video about different terms, about uh, different glacier, uh, different uh, icebergs, and um, different information he has about how the seals get caught in the ice. And if they get caught and the ice gets packed around them, he says they're like a tree sticking in the ice pack. So all this really fascinating terms in the Tlingit language that's only related to this place because it's only related to seal hunting knowledge. And that's not knowledge you're gonna get uh, anywhere else. So seals are so important because traditionally we never had moose, we never had deer, uh, and that was our main source of meat. Um, bear and uh, seal was our main meat. We didn't have any other kind of really meat in uh, Yakutat, so that was very important. And seal oil is, of course, very, um, it's not a saturated, it's uh, very healthy for you. It's a different kind than butter. It's not but saturated butter, well, it's, it's totally different. But we use it to preserve everything. And uh, during this time period, we're talking about uh, we really needed the skins as our own commodities, because we didn't have any really um, um, cash income, but the women really used those sealskin moccasins as a, a way of earning any extra income that they needed, because there was not a lot of jobs and things like that. So the sealskins were very precious to make into sealskin moccasins. So those that was some of the other things I was thinking about when you were talking about. But preserving our language, I think it's been really valuable. Um, and uh, looking at indigenous knowledge because uh, it shows our relationship and ownership of place. It shows our clan ownership. Uh, and it, we carry those names um, of those places. We give it those names to our children. So we're still carrying on those names. And um, Jason, my, um, my new owl brother, we did give him one of those place names as his name. So that's a way of carrying mm -hmm. our place names on um, and remembering it. And it also shows our spiritual relationship to place. And I think that's uh, in our cosmology, because our cosmology is from place. As I said, Kwashkaquan is who I am, and that's a place there. It's the Quash Creek. So this is very uh, important. But uh, the video that, uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna um, pick out was a really short interview I did about seal hunting. So I'm gonna go ahead and show it, but it does uh, show a lot of the traditional knowledge that my father has, and it's from his father's, his grandfather's people. So we're looking like six generations from um, my children to his uh, generation, to his grandfather's generation. So it goes back to a, a time period of the uh, 1800s where he learned this from his grand, grandfather's people because he was born about 1930. So it goes back many generations of knowledge that's in the past that is carried forward into the future. So he's the last um, traditional hunter. Uh, we had lost all our traditional hunters by that time. So he has very specialized knowledge about uh, traditional seal hunting. So I'm glad we were able to record it because you know my dad has Alzheimer's now and so we don't have any more traditional hunters that can talk about the kind of specialized knowledge that he has. So I'll let them run it. Thank you. <laughs>
my name is Wuch Juhuish. I am of the Raven Moiety, and I am uh, the Silver Salmon Clan from the Frog House. I was six and a half years old when they sent me back to my uncle, and I stayed with him for <clears throat> up until I was 21. All of our life is based on a time schedule of animals and of uh, animals that provide a food basis starting in March. And that's the fishing starts there. And after March, the hooligans come. And after that, the halibut come. And then after that, the pups are born. And uh, after that is the salmon run. And also clear down to the last in November when the bears start going into the cave. And uh, that, after that, that's the end of the uh, season for gathering food. The great big breakers come mm -hmm. off of that glacier all that way, and it caused a tidal, tidal wave, miniature tidal wave up in there. And when the current starts moving down, it just, I could say, six, seven knots of water running through that area. And I've watched good-sized icebergs come down, then they start spinning, and then they just go down, and they pop up way down here. Because what we're waiting for is this ice pack that's out here to start breaking open. They call it breaking open. Uh, and clink it. And clink it. You call it mm -hmm. That's like taking your mouth and pulling on it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's what it, when you translate it. Mm -hmm. It starts getting working our way out into that opening that's developing here. And you try to get, as it's opening, it's like that. There's ice is pushing that way down this way and clearing, holding this one back. And you'd get on there and you try to get to the bottom of it so that when it's going down, opening up like that, they call it yajakanakhih. It's just like something running along there. And you're hoping that it'll open up on a seal sitting on the ice. And how do you say that in Clinket when you're hunting along the edge? What's that term? That's a gurtu. A gurtu, mm -hmm. you get right to the base of it, mm -hmm. hunting along there. Mm -hmm. So that as it's opening up like that, the current is pushing. You can see the current pushing on that ice and breaking it open. And uh, you hope that it'll open. And then there's a lot of times we see them sitting on the ice like that. And if it should break into a herd, and they're not aware of you coming down through there, you look at them, mm -hmm. one seal will keep his head up mm -hmm. and he'll watch. And the rest of them sleep. And if you if you catch them that way, you take your time and shoot the one that's got his head up. And the rest of them will pop up their heads, look around. Well, the one who was watching, well, he's laying down now. As long as they don't see the blood gushing out of him, you see the blood gushing off of him, and they know that's something wrong. And then another one will hold his head up when they will all go back to sleep. 
And then you shoot that one, and you can shoot up to five seals if you're lucky. They used to say, uh, <clears throat> you shake the boat. Yaka Kawa Yuk. He just grabbed the side of the canoe like that. And, and the man who's sitting in front of the canoe, he knows there's something. He sees, he's, he's, you know, he knows that you have seen something that he hasn't seen. Mm -hmm. So you have to look around real slow. Look on both sides. And if you're by a cliff or something, you have to look up now without moving too much. If he doesn't see anything suspicious, then he'll turn his head around. And so he just can see you off the side of his eyeballs and, and you aim up. A mountain goat runner walking up the, mm -hmm. walking up the cliff, mm -hmm. or else he sees a uh, mother seal laying on there. Mother seal sleeping on the ice, mm -hmm. or else he sees something on the beach. That's a bear walking down there because a bear, once he swings his head to one side and he'll walk that way and he'll swing back to the other side, he'll walk that way. Mm -hmm. Can you describe the special canoes they had? It was, I don't know, I've never heard of any other place having one of those kind of boats. It's, it's a funny boat. And I remember they used to talk about them, but I never saw one. And so they said, one end of it is round like that. And down and underneath the water, it's got a prong sticking out about that much. And what they do is wrap seal skin around it. But the other end of the boat is made like a regular canoe. And it's called a goodie. My dad taught me when I was about Brandon's size, and it's mostly just pointing. You know, just follow, learn by example, and take take the boat out. And it's part of life around here. You know, I wouldn't be able to handle not having a boat. And <laughs> it's the only time I'm really happy is when I'm out doing something away from town or any sort of town. You know. Just out on the water, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, even if I don't get anything, it's better than sitting around watching television. <laughs> Not a whole lot of opportunity. He's going to be old enough to do it by himself real quick here. So I'm going to show him as much as I can before he takes off and does his own thing. How does it, uh, how does it feel to be able to uh, give food to your grandparents? Uh, it's pretty nice because they seem pretty proud of me. Well, we're, I, I, I think uh, maybe you have uh, questions that Judy or I could, could answer or, or talk about. Um, Did you want to mention how many megabytes or, or <laughs> te terabytes? I was trying to remember how many terabytes of video interviews we have. but. Um, yes, we were filming uh, for four years, and there's more than 70 interviews, and this is just a little taste. Um, we're really excited about working on the project now to make all of, the, all of this accessible uh, on a uh, one drive that will be accessible here at the Alaska Heritage Institute's archive, and then also at Yakutat Plinkett Tribe in Yakutat at their tribal archive. Maybe a future publication, too. And we are right. And then uh, uh, also with the current grant that we have, we are planning to jointly author a uh, publication, a final report publication. We want it to um, really be a, a resource book uh, for the community on the community history, everything that we learned 
of the traditional knowledge and the archaeological discoveries and the oral traditions and place names uh, all in one uh, volume. And so now we have some funding to uh, produce and, and publish that along with the archives. So and, and you already have a couple published papers. Yeah, so we some publications have, have come out already about the work and others in progress. Uh, and uh, uh, Judy has a, a excellent paper on traditional knowledge of sealing, some of which you just saw in the interview that's uh, coming out in a, a Smithsonian published book uh, this year uh, on the kind of the population history of different Arctic animals, including harbor seals. And uh, so we're, I'd say we're in a uh, uh, later stage of the project, but now is when we really want to get the information out and get it very accessible. Yeah, and w one of the reasons I got involved in the project is I was working for uh, Yakutat Klinka tribe and I was documenting uh, historical sites and um, Based on the work, uh, Aaron did a really wonderful paper on some of the sites that can be on the National Register, like the ones, because a lot of the sites, um, they didn't have any um, proof that we had these sites, but as a result of the, the archaeological investigation, this is a, our historical sites that we can actually get registered on the National Registry, which I think is fantastic because uh, a lot of the sites who are undocumented sites, so I really, I really think that's pretty wonderful. But uh, just um, all the information that's been um, is now preserved for future generations. As you see, we do have a few young people that are really, um, um, really interested in the language. Uh, Jan Devlin is a really good language speaker. Uh, both my children are really involved in language, and we have a, a language head start started in Yakutat. So all of this information is now documented where we can help preserve the language, and I think that's a really wonderful result of the research. But, um, you know, there's just so much information, and um, it's been really fantastic to... to and, and um, you know, Aaron's worked... Uh, just I remember at the end of one field season where we finally got everything packed up and everything is it's pretty you were like really tired. <laughs> oh my god because we had it was a huge effort and we we yeah. really we really thank the uh, so many people in the community who who dug into this and uh, in some cases they were out there literally digging with us uh, the high yeah. school kids and uh, but we spent so much time and you had being welcome into people yeah. yeah yeah we had right and we had lots of uh, college students from all over the country who came and took the uh, took it as an archaeological field school but it really was a um, really excellent community effort and Judy and I have given a number of talks in Yakutat just to keep people apprised of what we uh, have been working on and finding and are looking forward to this final you know return of all of this to the community in an accessible form so in the village in disenchantment bay I'll just Oh, yeah, I was hoping you would, yeah. I'm talking a minute, I want to ask you a question about that, but uh, Sea Alaska had selected the village in Disenchantment Bay that had been recorded by the Harrimans and recorded by Frederica de Laguna under ANCSA, uh, the 14-H1 site, and uh, which is uh, cemetery, which were cemetery and historic sites that were allowed uh, to regional corporations to select separate from their land selections. And uh, BIA went out there a couple different times trying to find it, but I know at least one time the, the snow was on the ground and they said they couldn't <coughs> find it. And then they went back again and couldn't find it. So that was never successful, successfully uh, selected and transferred to see Alaska. So this project came along and, and we were very interested in it because uh, maybe we could finally locate that site and understand its dimensions. and. and why don't you just summarize the well, scope that it, it... Yeah, it's, I think it was a very interesting decision uh, uh, in respect to the 14-H1 claim that it was the, all the oral tradition and historical photographs and everything, that was not considered enough evidence that this was an historic place. I mean, it's a little bit hard to believe, but that was... <laughs> but, but finding the physical remains of this village um, was very important, and I, I hope that it becomes the basis of a of a future and successful claim for that location because it's such an important place for the community. Uh, 
So that would be, that would be really, uh, that would be important. Um, I think there's so many ways to understand that place, you know, historically and through, uh, uh, you know, through the eyes of the uh, people in Yakutat, the meaning of that, of that place. And as Judy was saying, you know, the cosmology is, is place-centered, and this is truly one of the, those places. And it's also, you only have to go back a couple of generations to, or, well, three generations, I guess, to when people were still using it. But from, a, from an archaeologist's point of view, as you can kind of maybe gathered, this is a little bit like Pompeii in the sense that it's exactly what's there with these outlines of rocks and all of the artifacts and everything on the ground. It's exactly as the way people walked away from it. Can you um, mention a few of the really eight, cool eight, eight, stuff? I yeah. remember the porcelain dolls. Yeah, and, yeah, those yeah we, cool oh, we found lots of very interesting artifacts. But no one disturbed it because it got uplifted away from the current beach. And then the next year when people came back, I'm sure they came back to seal hunt in the year 1900, they were at a different place. They were farther down on the current shoreline. And so the old camp is completely undisturbed. There's nothing on it that dates past 1899. So, and it's all those rocks are in place, everything just as they walked away. And uh, Judy mentioned, we found uh, lots of fun things, interesting things, all of those beads. We had a very interesting discussion with, uh, with Lena Farkas and, uh, and your mom about beadwork. And yes, of course, women spent a lot of time doing beadwork at seal camp. And, uh, and Lena said, and then when they would, uh, you know, if you were done working on something, you might just kind of bury it in the sand a little bit, you know, just to keep it safe. And we found kind of clusters of beads under the sand that maybe were from that. You saw those clusters of beads at, kind of at the entrances to those tents where there would have been better light and where people would have been doing the bead work. And it all was so fascinating. We found little toys. We found parts of dolls. Uh, we found uh, clay marbles. Um, you know, these were things that people were uh, getting from the Alaska Commercial Company store all the way up in Prince William Sound at Newcheck because they were, every year they were taking um, canoe loads of seal skins up to trade at Newcheck and getting their guns, ammunition, uh, you know, beads, uh, all kinds of uh, goods that were coming into the economy for the first time. And so it was a really, really interesting <laughs> place. I apologize, I came in a little late, so I missed the beginning part. But uh, what are you doing, if anything, in partnership with the schools? I mean, this just sounds so rich um, that, you know, how are you sharing that? Or is the school there? Because I was just recently there, and I, I know you've kind of got this one school and a captive audience there. Is there any partnership going on with the district? We, we would, we've talked about and we would like to, uh, maybe once we get the, uh, the report done and all the information together to develop a place-based uh, curriculum, you know, about the community history. What did we learn about? That? I'd say that's a future aspiration to, to do that part of it. We did, it was very fortunate that we were able to offer uh, internships to uh, a group of high school students at the time to come out and experience the research and help us to actually do the research. And I thought that was very interesting, Judy, because mm -hmm. the group that was out there, I, I would see them digging uh, at that site on Knight Island, and they looked like they were bored or they weren't quite sure why they were there, and, and it, it was hard to tell what was going on. But then they gave presentations um, in the Alaska Native Brotherhood Sisterhood Hall in Yakutat couple weeks later, they were presenting, well, what did we learn at the site? And they gave professional PowerPoint presentations. They had been minds open, eyes open the whole time. They just hit it very well. <laughs> and they really learned a lot, and they were very enthusiastic about it. So I, I thought, OK, uh, this was a really good experience. So, um, And there was a um, uh, Sarah Lieben uh, was working on a curriculum while she was there. I'm not sure how that 
what what came of that. Yeah, I'm not sure because you focus more on other sciences. Right. This was a, a graduate student in education at UAF who was working on us so that sort of project. I don't know how it came out, but we'd like to do more. You know, we've. Uh, I know that um, the the tribe would like to see more like that too. So I appreciate your that suggestion, reinforcement, so I agree. You know, um, I think this would, I'm just so impressed with the fact, you know, with, with this project and how you sharing that to the community. You know, we had a, a presentation earlier uh, this month, and I forget the anthropologist's name, but he was from the University of Illinois, and they had started this whole initiative about, um, you know, when you do anthropology, when you do archaeology, you share it back with the community, and it's a community engagement process. And I was just wondering, you know, um, since, you know, this is such exciting stuff, I would think other communities would be excited to, to learn about your findings and about the way you engage the community and, you know, about this project, engaging the elders. To, talk about their knowledge, you know, other villages would be, would, would also, I think, um, benefit from this, from your mm -hmm. process. Have you, th have you thought about that at all? Well, sure, and, and there have been some other good, <coughs> similar projects. I was just, this summer, I was just out in Quinahuk in the western yukon Kuskokwim Delta, and that's a small village, Yupik village on the coast. They have been working with the University of Aberdeen in Scotland on excavating a seven or 800 year old site, ancestral site, um, that's right near the current village. And that was equally a uh, great level of involvement of the people in the community. And they then built their own cultural center. Uh, and all of the artifacts that came out of the site, including b preserved masks and bowls, it was a permafrost site, so you had nice wood preservation. All of that was conserved in Scotland, and now it's come back. And there, there's 60,000 artifacts from that site in this brand new cultural center that opened its door this August. And, uh, and now we're doing uh, some cultural heritage uh, programs, projects, through the cultural center. It's kind of follow-on information. Or uh, actually, we're doing a basketry project, because there was all these beautiful grass baskets found in the archaeological site. People can study the old examples and bring back this older style of basketry. So I, I think there's endless potential for that. And there's other sites that have, you know, up in Utkavik, they've done also very community-based excavations and elsewhere in Alaska too. So it's it's growing. It's an important trend. Yes. First of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Thank you for your presentation and Judy. The Moon House stands with the Owl House and supports you very much. I, my question is, are you guys going to put together an audio of the right pronunciation, like he named Night Island Gunawas in uh, uh, Kantak and Wasaydasha? You know, and there's other places that sometimes when I, I look at it, I can't pronounce it, you know. And if I do pronounce it, I pronounce it a different way. So that's uh, really important that we know how to pronounce these areas and if it's audio so we could, could learn it for ourselves. Second of all, I wanted to share a story about the seal hunting up. And I, I talked with your dad and I was telling the story about uh, Charlie Newman. He's a Chiscohit Owl House. And uh, his mother married a person from Angoon, and he got invited to Yakutat to go seal hunting. And so he went up there, and he said, since you're my brother-in-law, you get to shoot first. So they saw three seals up there. And he says, oh, my goodness. He said his heart was beating, and he took good aim, and he shot all three. And he says, good. And so he was pounding and patting himself on the back. When they went and got the seals, they brought it and started skinning it. And he goes, wait a minute. In Angoon, we'll skin it when we get back home. They said, yeah. They just smiled. And then they sewed the skins together. And he goes, what are you guys doing? 
Next of all, they took the skins and they started tacking it on the boat along the uh, uh, gunnel. And they tacked it in the front with the fat side out. And he said, now we're going to go up there and get more shields. <laughs> because the way the ice hits, it just moved them away and didn't make any noise. And uh, your dad said, I didn't hear that story. I said, I heard this story back in 74 when I was talking to Charlie about this, you know. So I just wanted to share that information with you. And thank you both very much for uh, gathering this information. And I really appreciate it. Thank you. On, on the audio, we, we actually have, um, between uh, Lena Farkas, who you saw, uh, and uh, George Ramos, and uh, Lane Abraham, and others who were interviewed, they go over many, many of the place names and pronounce them in, in Clinkett. So we do have the audio. And I, I think, it, yeah. <laughs> so I, we could, I mean, there's such a great place names exhibit down here in SHI. Uh, exhibit uh, gallery. I think maybe we could work with you to get those uh, audio, um, you know, pr the correct pronunciations just built into that exhibit. That would be. Yeah, that would be very easy to do. It would be great. First of all, I invite you to come down and look at our place names exhibit where we have uh, 3,500 place names from around the southeast mapped out, and we have sound files for 2,500 of them. Uh, now in Yakutat, the Yakutat area, we didn't have a lot of the audio files, so we had Jeff Lear, who had learned that northern uh, dialect, record some of those names. And then the others we tried to extract from tapes that had been made um, about 25, about maybe 15 years ago, whenever Tom Thornton did that project. Um, so if, we, yeah, that, that would be That would be a special use for could all higher come out quality, of the archive. Yeah. Higher quality um, sound files would be awesome to, yeah. to replace those recordings with. Um, that would be great. Mm -hmm. We'd yeah. love to do that. Okay. Well, so that's we have the, we have the ability to do that yeah. very easily. So I had a question, yeah. which is, what's the significance of the, the number five? Your dad mentioned um, shooting up to five seals, and then they would stop. Well, I think that that's the capacity for the, probably the skiff. <laughs> Otherwise, you'd be so weighted down here and navigating through the, the water and the ice with, with more than five year. Because we have pic old pictures of, of, uh, of him with a couple of big seals. Some of them are, you know, would be pretty big. <laughs> if you fit a couple of those in your skiff, you're kind of low water, I think. <laughs> well, and imagine those, those canoes. Uh, well, they used, flat bottoms too. Yeah, they used to go out with um, some big uh, boulders from the beach in the in the bottom of the canoe, and then as they got several seals done, they would get rid of that ballast. Uh, but uh, and I um, the the painting that you saw at the end, the watercolor, was part of a series that a wonderful um, illustrator Emily Kearney Williams did uh, for this project, and they'll be part of the publication. But you saw her painting recreated from the oral tradition, trying to visualize uh, exactly what it would have looked like when people were hunting with harpoons and the wooden canoes. And so uh, those are going to be an important part of the, uh, of the book. So. Yes. Sir. Uh, in reference to the lady's question on there, uh, all the native communities in South East have a similar mm -hmm. history of uh, the use of mm -hmm. harbor seals. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, contrary to the popular belief, the Eskimos do not use a lot of seal. Mm -hmm. The Tlingas in South East use more seal than any other mm -hmm. ethnic group in the state. Mm -hmm. I served on the Alaska Native Harbor Seal Commission for years. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ray Sensmeyer is one of our board members. Yeah. Yes, thank you. And we there's some uh, there's at least three interviews with with Ray Sensmeyer, uh, and he is so knowledgeable. He talked a lot about seals and sealing and his concerns about the seal population in the bay. And so it was it was very a great contribution. Yeah, I did a uh, subsistence survey in 2000, and I remember it's about 
137 pounds of seal per household people eat in Yakutat, yeah. I think Yakutat and, and Huna both are at the very high end, aren't they, of yeah. the seal consumption? Mm -hmm. The harbor seals, anyway, for the state. Yeah. I think that's all our time's up, huh? <laughs> We'd like to go on and on. Yeah. Uh -huh. well, I want to thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you.